America is at a unique moment in history, where activism and divisiveness are at an all-time high. Linda Sarsour, co-founder of the Women's March, finds herself at the center of both. You can count on me, your Palestinian Muslim sister, to keep my head held high, because I am not afraid. In 2017, Sarsour was catapulted into the limelight as one of the leaders of the Women's March. She is a controversial figure, beloved by some we love you, Linda! and hated by others. We all agree that Linda Sarsour is a Sharia-loving, terrorist-embracing, Jew-hating, ticking time bomb of progressive horror. In the last year, Sarsour has taken a step back from the Women's March and is refocusing her activism on the 2020 presidential race. She wants Trump out. This administration has a white nationalist supremacist agenda. We are living under fascism. This is fascism. And Bernie Sanders in. I believe in Bernie Sanders, and I know that Bernie Sanders believes in us. Today, we see activism. We believe and politics is coming. through the eyes of Linda Sarsour. Linda Sarsour, welcome to Through Her Eyes. You are known for being one of the co-founders of the Women's March, mobilizing millions of American women and women around the world. But beyond that, you actually have done a lot of things, and I want to uh, read some of them. You have helped to partly dismantle the NYPD program that spies on Muslims. You have worked with City Hall to close public schools on two Muslim holidays. You are the former executive director of the Arab American Association of New York. You co-founded a Muslim online organization platform, and you fought for higher wages for McDonald's workers. I wanna go back to the essential question, which is what was the point that triggered your activism? My radicalizing moment came immediately after the uh, horrific attacks of 9-11. I was a college student. Um, I got up from my class that day, walked out onto Manhattan Beach and saw these snowflakes of burned paper. And then I walked all the way home because there was no public transportation. And seeing all the businesses closed um, and seeing people in the streets going to get their children from school, and it was very early in the day. And then just a few days later, I was at the mosque and I saw women come to the mosque crying, saying that my husband has been taken. I haven't heard from my husband. I haven't seen my husband in weeks. So my radicalizing moment was watching the tears of women in my community losing their loved ones um, and understanding that they were living without their breadwinners in the houses and their children without their fathers. Because their fathers were rounded up and, and arrested. I live in one of the most highly concentrated Arab Muslim communities in the state of New York, and I've watched raids on coffee shops. I've seen men being taken out of apartment buildings. I immediately became a translator for women, helping them find legal services, helping them to find where and search for their loved ones um, in this very broken system that we have, this unjust system. And I've been here ever since. Sarsour was born and raised in a tight-knit Palestinian community in Brooklyn. Her parents, who were in an arranged marriage, immigrated to the U.S. in the 70s. My parents raised me to be very proud of who I am as a Palestinian-American, um, as an Arab-American, and as a Muslim. And uh, up until I was about five years old, I spoke only Arabic. Um, Arabic was my first language, although I was born here. How about your marriage? Was it also an arranged marriage? I was in an arranged marriage at the age of um, 17. I actually grew up in a community where arranged marriage was something that was very common. Um, and really what it just meant was that your parents introduced you to people and um, based on their family reputation, based on many other factors, I didn't see it as an impediment. Um, and in fact, right now, you know, as someone who's almost 40 years old, I have children who are college students. Um, so I'm grateful that I get to live in a world where me and my children are growing up together um, and we have been raised together, and I'm grateful to have um, children who are my best friends. Now, a lot of people probably are curious about hijab, your hijab. As a Muslim American myself, I feel like I may ask you about that. Yeah. What was the story behind your hijab? 
I grew up, you know, very fair skinned with dark hair, very ambiguous. People thought I was Puerto Rican. They really thought I was everything but what I really was, which was a Palestinian Arab American Muslim. And so the hijab gave me an identity that I didn't have and eventually evolved into my spirituality. It's a very important part of my spirituality. And my hijab reminds me of that every day. I get to walk out into the world and you may not know who I am or where I came from, but one thing you do know about me is that I'm a Muslim. I mean, it's interesting because you chose it as a point of identity and that point of identity also makes you a target, right? I mean, for me, hijab is a very confusing and complicated thing for everybody. But of course it's a target because it's a symbol. Um, and for many people, I'm shattering propaganda. Um, how could you wear hijab and, you know, uh, you know, stand up and, and be leading a women's rights movement in America? How could we be Islamophobes and say that the Muslims are so backward, but then they have all these Muslim women leaders now in America who are, you know, on the front lines? Like, it's very confusing, and, and I'm proud of being a, a confusing and uncomfortable leader. Interesting. I mean, and you hold that juxtaposition also, the arranged marriage, the outspoken women, mm -hmm. the woman who wears the hijab, and you hold it all in one picture. And that's part of, it seems like, intersectionality within your own one identity. <laughs> Interesting. Donald Trump is a sexist, racist, misogynist, xenophobe, homophobe, Islamophobe, transphobe. Linda Sarsour's outspoken, provocative brand of activism isn't without a cost. She has made enemies with both conservatives and progressives alike. And she caused a firestorm with the conservative right when she called for jihad against President Trump. I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. That's just garbage. That's meant to incite Muslims uh, to whom she's speaking. It certainly isn't meant to build bridges. Sarsour struck back, saying her use of the word jihad was taken out of context and stressed her commitment to nonviolence. People have called you divisive, vile, racist, anti-Semitic, and even worse, actually. Very worse. Yes. Those are, the, those are the nice ones. How do you respond to these attacks? You know, I have, I, I understand my history in the United States of America. There has never been an effective leader or organizer that has not been vilified. Um, and these tactics are used to discredit me because I'm so effective in the way in which I'm able to mobilize people of all different backgrounds. And so they use these things against me. I mean, for example, this idea of me being anti-Semitic is the most ludicrous of them all. I'm Palestinian. I believe in the liberation of the Palestinian people. I believe in the nonviolent movement of boycott, divestment, sanctions. And those positions that I just put forth are what critics will say makes me anti-Semitic, that being a, being a very staunch critic of the state of Israel, and I'm very unapologetic about that, just like I am a critic of the United States government in which I live in this country, and I'm not going to change my position. Well, let's, let's, go, let's go there, because Jared Kushner was asked whether he thinks the Palestinian people can have the freedom of choice to rule themselves. The hope is, is that they, over time, can become capable of governing. They being the Palestinian The Palestinians, I, I think that there are some things that uh, the, pal the current Palestinian government has done well, and there are some things that uh, that are lacking. Can so, they have freedom from any Israeli government or military interference? I, I think that it's a it's a high bar. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, Jared Kushner is the last person that should be trying to bring peace uh, to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The Palestinian people, uh, Zainab, were governing themselves before the creation of the state of Israel. We were a, a nation that coexisted inside of Palestine with Jews and with Muslims and with Christians. And I know that we can get back to a day where we can live in coexistence, where we can live in peace, and it's not going to be the ha at the hands of a fascist like Trump nor is it going to be at the hands of his son-in-law. What do you think about Trump's uh, peace proposal? Because he's calling it the, the, the deal of the century. I mean, Donald Trump has no idea what a deal is. I mean, he's a man who's filed for bankruptcy many times, so he doesn't understand how to make any deals, and he's not going to be able to bring peace uh, to that part of the world. And so I reject any deals coming from a fascist administration that is anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, and anti-Palestinian in the policies that have already been put forward by this administration. A lot of Jewish leaders are saying anti-Semitism has not only risen uh, in the in the right wings uh, places, but also it has risen in with progressive left. What do you say to that? Do you see it rising in general? Anti-Semitism is absolutely on a rise. We're watching anti-Semitic statements coming from right wing leaders and from this administration, and it's very scary. And I'm scared too um, for my Jewish sisters and brothers. 
But what sometimes people are not distinguishing is this idea of being unsafe and being uncomfortable. And the progressive left is sometimes very uncomfortable for people who are staunch pro-Israel supporters. But what's very clear to me is that the progressive left does not make Jews feel unsafe. It, and that's the distinction for me. Are you going to be uncomfortable in the progressive left as someone who supports the state of Israel? 100% it's going to happen. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I have positions that I hold, and I'm not going to hide my positions to make anybody else feel comfortable. And so for me, um, the right makes us all unsafe. Sarsouz believes they have brought her hecklers, hate mail, and death threats. I've had someone mail me a, a scrapbook with photos of my children in it. I have um, been heckled at events. I have had large campaigns led against me by pretty much every celebrity alt-right leader in America. Things that are it cause great trauma, and not just for me, but for my children as well. Um, so it's been exhausting. I've had physical issues, health issues. Um, I've had to take breaks at moments, um, uh, depression. Um, you know, there's just anxiety. Uh, and, and it's great to have a circle of friends and a circle of supporters. As much hate as there is, there's it, also the same amount of support out there. Now, I understand that your daughter recently was profiled in the Humans of New York, and she was quoted saying, she thinks she always has to be strong. I think if she could just sit down and say, I'm scared, it would tear things down. She could be mom instead of an activist. Tell me more about that story. It broke my heart uh, because I'm an activist um, all day, every day, and I truly believe I'm an activist for my children. I want to defend their right to be who they want to be in this country. And so it, it made me realize that sometimes I don't have to be that, and that sometimes um, that the injustice will be here tomorrow, and it'll be here next week, and the year after that. And we've lived in a world that have ha has had grave injustice for centuries, um, and I'm not the one that's going to solve the injustice. And so it, it centered me a little bit, and um, it gave me the opportunity for self-reflection. Do you think what's happening to Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar in terms of attacks, because they are getting attacked for about almost anything they say, is it encouraging more Muslim women to run or dissuading women from running? I think the attacks on Rashida and Ilhan have both effects. I mean, I think for some women like myself and other activists, it, it has allowed us to double down. And I think for some women, it is making them retreat. I think there are women who are in some leadership positions in our community who are wondering, do they want to take the next step? Because the next step is going to include being attacked. But I think majority of us, particularly younger women, are doubling down. Like, I am so fired up every time I see Rashida and Ilhan get attacked, and I've actually been helped helping to organize progressives around supporting them. And I see their strategy, and I think their strategy is right on. And they're in a tight place, and they're being attacked, but you know what? There's a shift in the conversation. In May, Sarsour shifted the conversation to white women when she blamed them for electing Georgia Republican Governor Brian Kemp. She tweeted, quote, white women continue to uphold the patriarchy after he signed the so-called heartbeat bill into law that places strict limits on abortion. Now, your critics would say you're not engaging these white women who have voted in that. Do you think there needs to be a shift in strategy to engage with them rather than only pointing the finger at them? For me, I may not be the person to engage um, white women. I'm very committed to organizing and mobilizing um, women of color and particularly uh, Muslim women. I think sometimes people have to hear the truth and the truth is always uncomfortable, and the truth is going to get you backlash. But in a place like Georgia, 70% of white women electorate voted for Brian Kemp. And somebody needs to ask the question, why? Why are white women in parts of this country voting against their interests and our interests? 53% of the white women electorate voted for Donald Trump. And that's a conversation that needs to be had. So, But how do we go about this conversation? So if I was a white woman, mm -hmm. I was like, well, Okay, there's no room for engagement. How do you go about engaging in conversations? I mean, I've had many conversations around the country. Obviously, social media is not a place um, to have, you know, engaging, constructive uh, dialogue. The way in which um, I thrive in society is different than the way in which white women do. And we have this, it's been historic in this country. I mean, white women um, have had a long history in upholding patriarchy. In fact, they have a long history of, you know, organizing with black women, with women of color. And then when they get what they want, they just leave white a woman of color behind, like in the suffragist movement. I mean, white women got the right to vote and then it took black women and 
other you know women of color decades later till they got the right to vote. So I'm in I'm in a resentful place. I'm not going to lie to you, and I want uh, white women to hear my my heart and my pain. And so I speak from a place of hurt. As I hear you speak, being a Muslim woman myself, Muslim women have also upheld patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Is there room for us to self-reflect as well, every community to self-reflect and owning that self-reflection? Absolutely. I mean, as a Muslim American, I engage in self-reflection all the time, and I encourage Muslims to engage in self-reflection because we too are holding traditions, often cultural traditions, um, that are unfortunately mislabeled as religious traditions, which they're not, um, in ways that do hurt women in our community. Sarsour says she plans to focus the next 15 months on the 2020 presidential campaign, mobilizing Arab Americans to vote. Are you backing or joining any candidates? I love Senator Bernie Sanders. I have a long relationship with him, and he's done um, a lot of great things for the Muslim community. He's been a champion on, for example, ending the war in Yemen. Uh, he's been a champion on really making Palestine a very important issue amongst the progressive left in a way that no other candidate has um, ever, um, at least from, from my time being alive. I also love Senator Elizabeth Warren. I'm in love with her. I think that she has a great opportunity to really um, do very well in this election. So I love Bernie Sanders. He's my first love. And then I also support Elizabeth Warren. What happened if Trump wins? <sighs> we just can't let him win. I, I have it in my mind that I'm going to do everything that I can. I'm going to work day and night, if that means leaving my family, to ensure that people understand the stakes um, that this is serious situation, that this is like code red, that we have to stand up as a nation in front of the whole world and say we are not a nation of bigotry, of hatred, of fascism, and potentially set an example for the rest of the world. I believe in the American people. I believe that we are going to win in 2020. This year, Sarsu plans to take a step back from her leadership role at the Women's March. She says the organization needs to evolve, particularly around race. I think that the women's movement has struggled for decades uh, to build an inter a truly intersectional movement. Um, and we're seeing some of those growing pains still today, and I have seen those growing pains. I want to be part of a movement that talks about racial justice and talks about the different privileges that we each bring to the table. Even I, as a light-skinned Arab-American woman, bring a lot more privileges to the table than black Muslim women, for example. And we were having hard conversations um, that women didn't want to have. Is there going to be a leadership shift in the, in the Women's March, really, with, with your own shifting of attention? Absolutely. I will stay on almost like honorary, because that is the organization and, you know, uh, Zainab, it's important for us, and particularly as women of color, that as we build things, that we ensure that the mission stays um, consistent with the vision in which we had only two years ago. I mean, Women's March hasn't been around that long. So I will continue to advise the Women's March. I'll be part of their electoral programs. But really, for me, 2020 was, is about winning this election. Linda Sarsour, good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck to Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thank, Thank you. you.